This is an experiment. What do billionaires, cultural icons, and world-class athletes have in common? I'm about to find out. I'm John Aguilar, serial entrepreneur, former decathlete, and creator and host of the CNN Philippines business reality show, The Final Pitch. Each week, I try to unlock the secrets of Asia's world-class performers to come up with hacks that I can apply in my own life. My goal is to have you apply them in yours. This is the podcast designed to change your life. This is Methods to Greatness. Methods to Greatness is powered by Converge. Experience better. If you'd like to work with Converge, check them out at gofiber.ph or connect with them through their social media channels. Methods to Greatness is also powered by Perfect Health Philippines, a leading provider of innovative and premium massage and healthcare products to customers across Southeast Asia. This partnership is all about improving people's lives, health, and well-being. Visit perfecthealthph.com to know more. As a global leader in robotics technology, Japan-based corporation SoftBank Robotics Group has taken massive strides in its creation of robot solutions that enhance our human experience. One of the great minds behind these innovations is our next guest, Chief Business Officer Kenichi Kent Yoshida. For the past 12 years, Kent has been instrumental to the growth of SoftBank and has sat at the helm of various projects for new business development. One of his best known contributions is the launch of Pepper, the world's first social humanoid robot that has the impressive feature of being able to recognize human faces and read emotions. Kent's ability to lead such developments comes as no surprise as prior to joining SoftBank, he was the co-founder and COO of the enterprise knowledge management software company, Realcom, which successfully listed on the market of high growth and emerging stocks or mothers at the Tokyo Stock Exchange in 2007. In this episode, we have the unique opportunity to learn how Kent is able to steer SoftBank in the right direction in terms of business innovation and what it takes to succeed in the highly competitive and fast-paced world of technology. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome on Methods to Greatness, Kenichi Kent Yoshida. Hello, Kent. Welcome to Methods to Greatness. Thank you. A lot of interest with SoftBank lately as well because of developments and also personally for me i just recently watched the the movie or the series on apple tv we crashed uh -huh. and uh, your ceo masa had a big role mm -hmm. in that series so i'd like to know first of all um, just to give people who are not so familiar with softbank perhaps you could paint us a picture of what the group is about and um, let us know, know exactly what what the business is of softbank okay uh, SoftBank is the uh, world uh, established 35 years ago uh, as the uh, software distributor. That's, that's the reason why we call it SoftBank uh, at the first time. But after that, we started the uh, portal uh, web service uh, uh, by Yahoo. And then we started the uh, broadband business uh, in Japan. Uh, then we started the mobile phone carrier uh, purchased the uh, Vodafone Japan. And we got the exclusive distribution of the iPhone uh, in Japan, uh, so that the, still uh, we are the uh, biggest market share of the iPhone uh, all over the world uh, in Japan uh, with the Sopang Mobile Japan. And then we entered the AI market and they started the Sopang Vision Fund, uh, which is the uh, largest uh, venture capital focusing on the AI and robotics. So let's say uh, SoftBank is the more like a, a IT innovator, and we're gonna start uh, investing the new uh, big things, uh, which gonna be, how to say, uh, coming in 10 years or 20 years later, and the, we're gonna uh, distribute those IT solution to the all of the people. So that is a SoftBank uh, business. So far, right. So, so that's a SoftBank, the, the SoftBank Vision Fund, in itself yes. is quite interesting because um, I think the way you described it, it really is smart money. I mm -hmm. think um, uh, you're able to uh, distribute and help um, whatever technology that um, you invest in. And uh, I'd like to, I'd like to first before 
getting into into your your life i mean uh i think uh i will i will get to softbank later on as well but um i'd like to know first um a little bit about yourself like how mm. you grew up in japan okay. and um what kind of childhood did you have that I, I guess in a lot of ways influenced what you are doing now okay good um let's say I was born in Japan and, you know, uh, grow up in Japan, but the, my, you know, first uh, contact with the IT industry is in, in my university age. Uh, I saw that the uh, Macintosh computer at the uh, computer room in the university and I was so shocked. Uh, you know, we believe that I believe that the, everything will be changed. Uh, so that's the reason why uh, I went to the Silicon Valley uh, at the university timing and to actually I, I am not the university student of the Berkeley University at that timing, but I uh, uh, joined the classroom uh, of the uh, you know, Berkeley, uh, UC Berkeley University, and okay. then I tried to uh, study that the, how to say, IT uh, tech industry uh, at that timing. And then I established the uh, software company in Japan. Uh, as you said, that the, we, we, we call it Realcom. Uh, and the success, fortunately, uh, you know, we can go, we can, uh, we went to IPO uh, for the Realcom, but the uh, it's kind of the uh, small company. So that's the reason why I uh, joined the uh, SoftBank um, uh, 13 years ago. Okay, mm. so you're an entrepreneur uh, with Realcom. Uh, you were running and trying to scale your own business, but as you yeah. said, you felt that it was too small. Mm -hmm. I guess you had bigger ambitions. That's why you wanted to be part of something bigger than yeah. yourself, your business. So what was that transition like from being an entrepreneur, uh, doing, doing your own thing and now leading initiatives in a much larger organization that obviously mm. um, is a, uh, um, a world player uh, what was that like, the transition from your okay. previous life to now joining SoftBank? Okay. Um, interestingly, uh, SoftBank is the much quicker or faster than the startup, startup I established. Because of the, you know, master decided so fast and the, you know, move so quickly, or let's say, uh, withdraw the business very quickly. Uh, he changed his decision uh how to say every day so <laughs> actually you're talking about the, you're talking about the ceo masa yeah ceo masa sorry uh sopak ceo masa so i mean uh for the team under masa it's very tough to work with him but the finally we understand that the, this is the only way to survive in the it industry because that the all of the environment is changing uh every day or every minute so we need to change the decision every minute. So that's the maybe how to say the way to survive in the IT industry. So I, I, don't, I don't feel any, how to say big company or kind of the uh, lead tape type of a process in SoFan. It, it's still a big startup company and the, everything is the, uh, you know, decided based on the master's vision, master's direction. Of course, the, he can handle the all of the business but the big direction he decided, then we, we just go. So that is the culture of SoftBank. Right. It seems to be that you've kept the, I guess, the spirit of a startup of being agile and being mm -hmm. able to, I guess, make very quick adaptive decisions, regardless mm -hmm. of the size. Please give us a perspective of how big SoftBank is now, the reach, the footprint, um, first to be able to appreciate what exactly that um, decisions like that affect the entire organization how big is softbank right now well it's very difficult to explain but the let's say we have the um, maybe 400 or 500 of the portfolio company and the uh, softbank itself is not so big organization uh, it's like a, I, I think that it's a thousand people uh, okay. but we have the uh, hundreds of the portfolio company and the it, it's it's not the, our subsidiary. Uh, it's more like a portfolio company, so that the, they also have the individual rights to decide, but we can influence them. So, for example, uh, 
I mean, we are the subsidiary, 100% subsidiary, but the, uh, for example, our portfolio, robot portfolio company like uh, Gaussian Robotics or Brain Corporation and Infogrid, which is the cleaning related robot company, we invest them, but it's just uh, 30 or 40% uh, of the share uh, we have. So that the, we can ask them to produce this type of robot, or are we gonna do the go to market, this robot for globally, but the, let's say we cannot order uh, you know, everything to them. So this is a kind of the management structure of the SOFAN. And the, uh, let's say master decided that the big dilution like, uh, okay, <clears throat> cleaning market uh, will be automated by robot uh, in three years. Then master asked us, uh, please find that the who has the best technology. And then we, we're gonna start uh, searching the, you know, uh, the company who has the technology, best technology, let's say due diligence, technical due diligence. And then we identified, okay, this company, this company, and then we invest from the Sobank Vision Fund. But not only the investment, uh, but also that the, we usually propose that the, we're gonna provide the global go-to market together. And the, the our uh, winning scenario is the, how to say, uh, easy to uh, be adapted or that's okay. easy to be penetrated. I mean, let me pick up the one example for the iPhone. The, the reason why uh, in Japan, the iPhone has the biggest market share in the world because that the, we started the free iPhone model uh, in Japan uh, first. Uh, actually, it's not a free because that the customer have to <laughs> make a two years contract right, uh, of right. the Soba Mobile Japan, but it, it's actually free. So let's say that's the reason why everyone can use the smartphone. Uh, it costs usually, you know, $1,000 or $2,000 so those kind of the business model is very important to penetrate the market uh, quickly. Another example, uh, okay, so we did the ADSL, uh, I think it's uh, uh, 20 years ago, uh, broadband services. And we give it away, uh, the router, router of the ADSL at the all of the major Japanese station. And just, it's, it's free and just try and three months free. And then uh, we can get a million of users uh, in one year. So that kind of the business model is very important. So we can propose to the, our portfolio company, okay, so you focus on the uh, product development technology, but we're gonna provide the go-to market uh, for each country. And then we can gain the big market share in one right. year. So that's our you know, strategy. Right. Quick market penetration, which you obviously mm -hmm. through your global network provide um, as well. Uh, and let me get back now to um, uh, We Crashed, uh, that movie on, on Apple TV. Very interesting pivotal moment um, in that series where uh, Masa asked Adam Newman the question, you know, who in the end who wins? Is it the crazy one or the smart one? <laughs> and, um, you know, and, and, and Masa, according to Masa, it's the, the crazy one who wins, which really also influenced a lot of the decisions of an already very aggressive Adam Newman into further expanding um, uh, to a totally different level, his current, I guess, locations around the world. So mm -hmm. if he was expanding at breakneck speed, Masa literally um, flamed the fire and essentially, um, I guess, really supercharged uh, mm -hmm. the, the growth of we work across the world. So I think if you're gonna go with, with that and how you say it, I mean, really these, these, these portfolio companies, is there, is there any expectation that they follow along the same lines of thought that you have to be crazy or at least um, ha implement very, um, I guess, aggressive. Some might even say, um, I don't know, uh, because these are super aggressive deals and, and, and movements. Mm -hmm. right? And uh, mm -hmm. we saw that for ourselves in that, that TV series. So is that something that is across the board? I mean, across the company, something that is encouraged? Um, and if it is, you know, what, what kind of decisions does that entail? Uh, not just for 
uh, SoftBank, but for the founders who are expected to go with the same vision that Masa has of clear domination at breakneck speed, the fastest way you can do it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. Um, there is the words uh, of the Masa. Uh, he usually say is the, we need to think through uh, until the brain uh, break up. So that's that kind of, <laughs> you know, uh, words he, he lacks. So we need to be creative. Uh, we need to be sometimes crazy uh, for the business model, like a free iPhone, a free modem, or even free WeWork tenant rental. Right. So that kind, I mean, to be aggressive, uh, to gain the market share uh, in a very short term, yes, we need to be, how to say, crazy. But at the same time, uh, we need to be realistic. So let's say we need both. So Masa is let's say, you know, taking a part of, you know, crazy part, <laughs> right. but right. we are doing the reality part. So right. basically Masa has the, let's say 10 idea, 10 crazy idea, yes. but usually let's say we just do uh, one of them uh, because at the nine of them, uh, we just, uh, you know, report to Masa, I'm sorry, uh, it's a good idea, but the reality was this and this and this. And usually, finally, Masa gave up. But the one of you know ten, it's a really, really crazy idea. But there is a chance to win. Then we can do. So that's a maybe the you know success case is the iPhone, free iPhone or free modem. And we work maybe we cannot say it's unsuccessful, but the it's a little bit too early to or let's say it's too, too big to invest. So. Let's say that's kind of the uh, decision making process uh, within the SOPA. Right. It seems that um, as chief business officer, you're the one who reigns in the ideas, um, the, the great grand vision of MASA, and to be able to operationalize it and give very critical feedback on the viability of an idea of, uh, I guess, a growing company also with regards to the portfolio companies. Um, I'd like to understand the push and pull of that dynamic. Um, working with such a visionary, an aggressive, crazy visionary, I might say. Um, how was the work dynamic of trying to balance um, the bigness of the vision and just getting it down to how to do things? How does that dynamic work um, in, in your relationship with Masa as you go about um, not just the big plans, but the daily, uh, the day-to-day -day of running the operations in the business. Mm -hmm. Okay, so maybe a uh, very popular words uh, from Masa is the let's say locket uh, driving, you know, management. That means uh, locket usually change the orbit, you know, every second. So that means that the Masa can change his decision every second. So okay. based on <laughs> that, would be a, I, I would think that would be a, quite a headache for someone who's trying yes. to operationalize everything, right? Yes. Yeah. For, for example, you know, someday morning, I must say, go right. But the afternoon, no, 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 no. Go left. So that kind of things. So, <laughs> but um, that is also needed because that the, again, situation is changing every day, but, and this, Sometimes, sometimes we need to decide, okay, let's give up, let's withdraw. So usually the CEO cannot say, uh, let's give up, but the master can easily say, let's give up. Man, you know, we, we, we want to say that you say, let's go three days ago and we prepare, but the, you change the world, but he doesn't care at all. But <laughs> that is needed for the CEO of the IT company you know, based on the situation. We shouldn't care about that the what we have committed before or what we have said. Uh, most important thing is now and the future. What is a simulation for the future and what is the current uh, environmental situation? Right. Mm. Uh, it's quite interesting to have, uh, and I appreciate this as, you know, an entrepreneur looking at, um, I, I guess, the fund as, because sometimes if you're the CEO, you've put in so much work 
an effort into a particular direction that you find a hard you find it hard to be able to shift direction because there is so much sunk cost already. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. time and resources, but then to have the ability and I guess the luxury to be able to change your mind just like that because you know that this is at this point in time the right decision or the right thing to do, regardless of the effort or resources that have been poured in. That is, I, I think one of the ultimate luxuries that you're able to mm -hmm. indulge in um, as a fund and as a, and as a company. And um, it is quite unique in the sense that mm. not a lot of people have that luxury because, you know, in our day to day, you know, we find it hard to change direction and, and to be that agile because of things that have set in motion that we would like for things to work out. Um, even if maybe the opportunity has already passed or, um, it might not be the right thing to do anymore. So I, I really truly appreciate what, the, the, what that, that, that affords you to do um, as a fund. And I guess as the business leader, uh, Masa um, has had the ability to, to do uh, just from the fly. Methods to Greatness is powered by Converge. Experience better. Converge has been an instrumental partner for myself, for our organization, because everything we do right now is digital. Everything involves liaising, coordinating with people, with other companies, and all of this is done online. And our medium being video is very, very highly data-driven. We need a stable, reliable internet connection to make everything we do work. What Converge has given us was a way to be able to successfully carry out all of the tasks of the team, reach out to our audience, to our market, and also allowed us to be able to create more things with what we do. My team has been a direct beneficiary of this. I think this pandemic has given us a lot of opportunities to pivot, and this is our latest pivot into the future, which really is a digital world for Methods to Greatness. I'm interviewing world-class performers, icons, CEOs from Asia, from around the world. All of those interviews are done online. They're all done via a video call. It was very critical that we had a reliable internet connection that would enable me to carry on these conversations with these icons from all around the world. That is one of the reasons why we're able to do what we do now. So if you'd like to work with Converge, check them out at gofiber.ph or connect with them through their social media channels. This episode is also brought to you by Perfect Health Philippines. Did you know that massages are considered one of the best ways to recover from exercise and is considered an indispensable part of any fitness training and recovery regimen? Getting a regular massage not only detoxifies your muscles from lactic acid buildup, but also increases muscle performance, blood flow, reduces pain, and induces better sleep. If you don't have access to a masseuse, the next best thing is a massage chair or a massage gun. Perfect Health has a complete lineup of massage chairs with a whole range of features and price points. Their top-of-the-line model, Perfection 2, has all the bells and whistles. From 3D full body and foot massage functions, voice command, Bluetooth, and zero gravity. Their Perfect Relaxer Massage Gun is a personal favorite of mine, which I use on my quads every time I come from a long bike ride. Methods to Greatness in partnership with Perfect Health Philippines has come up with a special discount promo that is exclusive to our followers and subscribers. To avail of the special promo discount, get in touch with Perfect Health's professional healthcare consultants at perfecthealthphcustomerservice at gmail.com or via hotline 02-8831-6944 and give the promo code MTG. That's the Methods to Greatness promo code MTG and the healthcare consultants will hook you up with the best premium massage chairs, massage guns, and other healthcare products, all with a special discount. I'd like to get to your decision-making process and how you're able to uh, manage, uh, I guess, uh, the, the, the different portfolio companies. Um, could you give me an idea of what it's like to be in your shoes, um, I guess, as you, as you progress through this organization and trying to see what the next things are going to be. Um, what is the process like of, of developing these alongside your portfolio companies? And, 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 and are, are there any insights that we can glean from you with regards to how you can grow, given there's a set direction, a company um, that adjusts to the conditions of the environment of the market? Okay. 
currently we focus on the uh, physical automation technology, uh, which means that the, there is the manual labor work uh, in the field. And there are a lot of tasks and, you know, uh, vertical, but the uh, first uh, we started the business in the cleaning or facility management industry, uh, because of the basically 1% of the population is janitor in each country. So that means uh, actually that the uh, 70 million people, uh, 70 million janitor doing the cleaning every day, uh, at least for the let's say high wages country, uh, or let's say advanced country, we can have the 20 million or 10 million janitor uh, they are doing. And one third of the janitorial work is the floor care, and the, that can be robotized easily. So that kind of the uh, way of the thinking, we can identify that which target market we should work on. At the same time, we should see the technological roadmap. And the, Let's say maybe five years later, 10 years later, autonomous driving uh, will come, but the, our understanding, it is not ready because at the uh, safety level, we need a 99.99999% of the safety is needed for the public road uh, autonomous driving. However, uh, indoor uh, navigation is much more simple and the there is no law uh legal regulation and it's a slow speed or let's say uh there is a wall to understand the map uh, so that we can easily understand the position using the lighter which is the one of the sensor and the, so i mean technical readiness is different okay so indoor low speed uh, mobility it's already here uh, outdoor low speed uh, navigation, maybe next year. Outdoor high speed navigation, maybe five years later. So we, we need to see the market opportunity and the technical readiness. And then, okay, we should do a uh, cleaning uh, robot right now. Or right. let's say trade delivery robot for the restaurant, maybe next year. So that kind of decision is very difficult because that if it's too early, maybe we cannot be successful it's too late maybe someone <laughs> will be successful so those decision of the timing is the very uh important right it's yeah. interesting that you mentioned about um autonomous driving because just last week i was in tel aviv and i was able to uh, personally test drive quote unquote test drive um their autonomous um driving technology which has two two versions of it one is just uh, being led by by cameras, so it just mm -hmm. relies on on um, data that derives from the camera onboard cameras, and another is more for their um, commercial application of a robot taxi, which has all the redundancies of both um, sonar and um, visual cues from the camera. So, according to them, that this is a technology that is going to be in the market much sooner than we think. It's going to be. Um, it's currently being tested right now um, in different parts of the world, adapting to very specific nuances of each individual country or culture, and um, uh, it is going to be tested perhaps in, in, in Tel Aviv or Jerusalem um, by, by end year of this year uh, with an expected expansion by next year. So uh, don't quote me on this, but you know it's quite interesting for me as uh, a possible future customer um, the possibility of seeing this on our roads um, in the future. And if there is something like that right, right now that is able to, I guess, convince you that safety is 99.9%. I know that Japanese culture really essentially um, wants nothing left to chance. Um, you have to be 100% sure or 99.9% sure. Um, what is going to be the, the decision for you to say, okay, right now, this particular company is ready. We can make the investment. We are sure. Or is there something still left to chance in terms of giving them giving them a little bit more wiggle room to be able to make their mistakes um, beyond or, or you know outside of that ninety nine point nine percent? That's the reason why uh, we have the two business units under Sopan Group. I mean, Sopan Vision Fund, uh, which is the venture capital. Uh, the other is the Soban Robotics, which is the business unit. So basically, before going into the investment, 
we propose the solution to the client and the mm. sound, the marketability. And then if the customer say, oh, yes, there is a big pain for that area and I want to do this, uh, then maybe we can propose that the proof of concept project with the portfolio company and the, you know, validate the technical readiness as well as the customer needs. We need both. So if the those POC proof of concept project is fine, I mean successful, then we can go to the investment. So let's say we can call it the technical due diligence, but for us, it's more like a proof of concept project with the real customer. So that, that is also very important for the investment decision. Right. So that proof of concept, um, I guess, project, is that something that you fund as well as your initial investment prior to making a bigger investment? Usually, yes. Uh, usually POC is funded by SBR ourselves. Sometimes there is no company uh, fund. Uh, in that case, that the, we should develop everything, but the, we can procure some technology. For example, three years ago, there is no cleaning robot. So that's the reason why we developed the clean robot by ourselves, a code with, and we invested the brain corporation, but they can just provide that software, automatic navigation software, so that we combine the, our hardware and the you know, brain corporation software, then we can provide that the uh, with. And the, fortunately, uh, with uh, became the global number one uh, clean robot, but the, right now there are a lot of the cleaning robot company like uh, okay number two is the gaussian robotics and the, there are a lot of company then we just invest the gaussian robotics uh, so at this moment we have the with as our own product as well as the gaussian robotics is our portfolio company so this is the way of the soban uh, group is developing the market maybe sometime we need to do by ourselves but if there is the company, uh, we can just invest. Right. Okay. So I want to get into the, the cleaning robot that mm -hmm. you just mentioned just now. And prior to this interview, as we were talking offline, you did mention that uh, you had come from InterClean Summit. Um, can you give us an idea of what this summit is about? But also, I'd like to add that you had just come from this InterClean Summit um, but right now, tell us, t tell the, please tell our viewers and listeners where you are and your particular health condition. Okay, good. Um, Intergreen is the world's largest cleaning equipment or cleaning robot uh, summit or trade show in Amsterdam, uh, Netherlands. And actually, we couldn't do the Intergreen for three years uh, because of the COVID-19. So this is the first time. Uh, after the pandemic. So, I mean, uh, more than 30,000 people joined. So that's good news. And there are a lot of the new cleaning robot or there's a disinfection robot or sensors, air quality sensor, that good news. Uh, but the, yes, um, actually uh, I found that, that the uh, COVID-19 positive at the border of the Japan, uh, okay. maybe I got uh, infected from the uh, intergreen, but it's very natural because of the, uh, you know, within 30,000 30, people. Yeah, yeah, people, <laughs> hundreds of the COVID 19, uh, you know, uh, infected people there. Probably. So, I mean, this is, a, you know, another a discussion and how, how we can manage that the, those physical, how to say, uh, communication. We, we, we need the physical communication, global right. physical communication, but you know, we want to manage the disinfection type of the topic. So that's, the, I mean, actually, I'm in the uh, quarantine hotel uh, in Japan, and I need to serve that quarantine for seven days, but they, luckily I don't have any symptoms, so that's okay. But yes, so that's a reality for, for the, how to say, uh, after COVID-19, the cleaning or disinfection ratio, but I got the infected by COVID-19. <laughs> <laughs> the irony in it all. Um, you know, the, but you know, that, that really is the reality. And, and now that you mm -hmm. mentioned it, uh, I just like to share also that I had just come from, from Tel Aviv and uh, from Jerusalem and uh, in Tel Aviv, I, I, I also attended a few uh, trade show summits, uh, in particular, the, um, the mobility summit 
uh, which similar to the um, Interclean Summit was not being done the past two or three years. Mm -hmm. And this was the first time, and it was, came as quite a shock to me that when I went to that summit, no one was wearing a mask. I mean, from, from the hundreds, maybe thousands of people that I was with, uh, I saw maybe a total of two people mm -hmm. who had masks. Mm -hmm. So the mm -hmm. confidence in people, I guess, largely the population being vaccinated mm -hmm. and also the tourists or, you know, people who come into the country also having had to undergo some sort of COVID test prior to entering, I guess it um, has given a lot of confidence for people to just say, and this happened two weeks ago when the, the, the rules for mask wearing in, indoors was lifted. I think um, by next week, even the, the uh, RT-PCR test that is required for you to enter the country also will be lifted. So I think mm -hmm. this is the new normal that Israel is poised to have because of their adaptation um, to, to just having everyone being vaccinated already and accepting that people can and will get it. But the treatment and I guess the future way of looking at it has now been, I guess, um, uh, taken to this level where, okay, uh, the management um, of the virus is what is, uh, instead of just asking everyone to just stay home or wear masks. And um, for all you know, uh, you know, I, maybe I did, or, or I have got, I, I have taken a, a, an RT-PCR test just before I flew back to Manila. And fortunately I did not get it. Uh, I did not get COVID, but um, you're right. I mean, with thousands of people, um, and I also went to the, to the Holy Land. I also went to the old city and I was also with a lot of tourists, um, you know, so yeah, th that's the new, um, I guess, normal that we're looking at. And I'd like to find out from you from the Interclean Summit, what was, I guess, one of, one of your biggest takeaways uh, moving forward as we are now thrust into this, I, I, I wouldn't want to say post-COVID world because we still are in it. But what does the future hold, hold for us? Uh, and maybe you could use this as a, as, a, as a way to be able to also talk about your robotic cleaner as well and the technologies okay. that you're trying to develop. That, to develop. Hmm. Speaking of the cleaning or facility management industry, uh, COVID-19 is a big trigger for the industrial change. Uh, before COVID-19, which is more like a art. Uh, so let's say we, we can uh, decide the cleaning spec uh, because the, it is already defined uh, and it, it's not changed for 30 years and there's no logic. So that's uh, before COVID-19. But after COVID-19, uh, we can look into the invisible, how to say, a uh, virus or let's say uh, scientific measurement of the cleanliness of the air and floor. And that is needed right after the COVID-19. Um, for example, the floor, uh, we are using the ATP test, which is the one of the methods of the uh, counting the number of the microorganisms on the surface or on the floor, and the, which is usually used for the uh, restaurant industry, f and industry. And the, okay, so dishes uh, should be under thousand score of the ATP, or let's say chef's hand should be under 3,000. So that is the defined by the each local government. But the cleaning industry uh, start using those ATP uh, measurement uh, test for the definition of the cleanliness. Uh, so actually we did a survey uh, for the lot of the floor, like, uh, okay, so 100 of the office carpet and the average is 10,000 score and the let's say our target should be 7,000, which, which, I mean, this number uh, can contain not only the microorganism, but also that the, let's say, mites, fungus, or even virus. So, I mean, not only just the visible cleanliness, but also that the disinfection point of view, uh, that cleanliness is very important. So, for example, not only the floor, but also that the table, or let's say elevator button, uh, we can count the number of the microorganisms. So that kind of a trend is the huge change for the cleaning industry. So that's the reason why Interclean, a uh, lot of the robots and sensor uh, is on the show uh, because that the, we need to bring the science to the 
human work. Uh, and the robot and sensor can be the trigger to change that the janitor to the science world. So that's maybe the big trend for the cleaning industry. Yeah. Talk to us about the robot for people who, who have not seen it or who have not heard of it. Uh, what does this robo, uh, robotic cleaner look like? Because like for us in our home, we have a robot vacuum, but that's pretty much um, the only exposure to, um, I guess, robotic cleaning technology that we have in our home. So what does, what does this look like? And um, what are the things that you can talk about that maybe will prepare us for a future where more and more of our, I guess, household chores uh, will be done uh, by robots that help us in our daily lives? Okay. Um, maybe uh, the professional cleaning robot is uh, slightly different from the consumer uh, cleaning robot. Uh, one uh, requirement is the robot cannot bump into the wall. Robot cannot, uh, you know, hit the people. So we need the autonomous driving uh, technology. So, and the layout is changed every day. So janitor, I have to use a robot as a tool. So usually that the, for the day one, a janitor is using the robot for the cleaning by manual. But uh, for the day two, they can press a button, uh, do it uh, same as yesterday. And then during the robot cleaning, a uh, janitor is doing another job. But if there is the different layout or some obstacle box, maybe robot can have to beat off. Or let's say if the people walk by, robot have to wait. So that kind of function is the difference uh, between the professional cleaning robot and consumer cleaning robot. And the let's say um, still uh, two thirds of the janitorial work uh, cannot be done by people. Um, let's say uh, hopefully in the future uh, all of the uh, tasks can be done by robot, but the human capability is the very advanced. And I feel that it's very difficult uh, to uh, create a robot to do the all of the task uh, in the household. So let's say at least at this technology, uh, at this moment, uh, we can just do one third of the janitorial work. So that means collaboration with the human janitor is uh, very important. So it's not like a uh, everything is done by robot and the machine and AI. No, still mainstream is the human being. But a uh, human being can manage a robot and sensor, or let's say a uh, low value added task like a floor care uh, shouldn't be done by the people. For example, um, let's say uh, bathroom cleaning, let's say. It's very different, I mean, bathroom by bathroom or a level of the dirtiness, uh, you know, we need to, you know, change the way of the cleaning uh, and it's very complicated. We cannot develop the, the bathroom cleaning robot, let's say maybe in five years. So in that case that the people have to do that kind of a task. However, broker is very simple, very easy, every day, just same broker so that we can ask the robot, uh, you know, should do these tasks. Or let's say, I mean, the value for the janitor to the client is not for the labor, but for the, let's say, concierge type of the flexible, you know, services. Um, today, uh, there is uh, the other data area, please do this, or please do that. So it's very flexible ask. Uh, that can be only by human janitor, not the robot. So maybe, you know, our experiments, uh, we are doing the digital transformation, but the, uh, that's not reduce the, how to say, value of the people. That's basically increase the value of the people, uh, while the low value added task uh, will be done by the robot. So right. that's the big picture. Yeah, because uh, there's always this fear that automation will mm -hmm. render uh, people obsolete and mm -hmm. that um, it will uh, practically make jobless people who have, yeah. um, you know, uh, certain defined functions that are now being replaced by robotics. Mm -hmm. uh, so what you're saying now is that it actually enhances the ability 
of, in this case, the janitor to be able to, I guess, do their work more efficiently, faster. But um, I think this will also lead to uh, new jobs or new skill sets in the future. What in particular do you feel would be, I guess, the way people can adapt to a world where you see more and more robots complementing their current, um, I guess, uh, output? And, and how do you see that or how do you see people evolving um, as people who provide the service to a client? Mm -hmm. You're right. So we need to ask janitor to upskill uh, their capability. I mean, rather than just doing the task, I mean, they have to be a, let's say, uh, hygiene consultant or let's say robot manager. I mean, to manage the all of them and, you know, uh, confirm the cleanness or hygiene level to the client. But that's a little bit different capability uh, than what they have right now. So let's say robotization is not uh, you know, stealing the human job, but the robotization push the people to, how to say, upskill. We need to change our way of working. I mean, focusing on the, you know, high value added tasks. Okay, you being Japanese and talking about cleanliness is, uh, I, I think uh, this is a very serious topic for all Japanese. Also, um, you were wearing masks even before COVID. So there really is a lot of focus on cleanliness, even, even as a culture, you are known for that, which only goes to show that you really are seriously um, invested uh, in this space. And I know for a fact that um, you are distributing this as well, this, this technology, or you're working with Singapore. Um, for for this, which is another country that is known for being very clean uh, and taking cleanliness um, and hygiene very seriously. So um, what do you see the future? What does the future hold for, um, you know, uh, working with Singapore um, mm -hmm. with this technology? And, um, you know, culturally, what what kind of impact do you think this will have on uh, not just Japan, but but um, in in highly, I guess, uh, clean uh, cities like um, like Singapore, for example. Okay. Um, yes, uh, indeed. Uh, Singapore government uh, did a great job for the uh, managing the cleanness of the cities, and they started at the SG Clean Initiative uh, to standardize the cleanness level for each facility, and at the same time, Singapore is the uh, let's say most uh, clean robot penetrated country in the world. Uh, there are two reasons. One, uh, there is a subsidy from the government uh, for cleaning robot, so that the all of the cleaning company or facility start using robot. So that's the one reason. The other reason is the um, most of the janitor uh, is not a Singaporean. So usually uh, there is the you know, existing cleaning company or janitor uh, is uh, basically against uh, with the robotization uh, because of the, their, you know, they have the fear uh, of the, let's say, uh, you know, robot can steal my job, but they, we don't have to worry about that in Singapore. Um, even they want to, they have to uh, robotize the janitor because that they, they cannot procure the janitor from the overseas because of the COVID-19. So let's say uh, that's the reason why um, Singapore can be the future test bet or launch pad uh, for the other, especially Asian country. And then maybe we can duplicate that the best practice of the Singapore to all over the country in Asia. Okay. So I'd like to now go to the fact that Singapore also recently allowed non-compulsory mask wearing um, in the office space, which um, uh, I think is, is going to be a, a stronger trend uh, in the coming months. Um, I'd like to get your opinion on that. What, what do you think of that, um, that, that trend that we are now seeing of people just opening up and uh, uh, being a little bit more lax with um, the fear of, or, or at least the, um, the means by which we uh, personally shield ourselves from the virus. Yeah, it's a very interesting discussion because of the you know Asian country tend to wear the mask uh, even without the legal regulation. 
uh, while that the Western country, <laughs> they don't wear masks <laughs> if right. there is no legal regulation. Right. Um, maybe there are several reasons, but maybe we are more careful about that the how to say uh, infection, or let's say we have the some cultural background and we don't care that wearing mask, but the, maybe Western people care a, a lot, or maybe we are the successor of the ninja, so we are we used to wear the mask. So <laughs> kidding, <laughs> maybe that's uh, that, that, that kind of makes sense now, now that you think of it. But I, I think also culturally, um, uh, you know, the the East is more. Uh, I guess we we follow the rules uh, mm. more, right? Uh, and the West is more for individuality and just really respecting their individual rights. Whereas the East, um, we we go with the consensus and we respect the I guess the the rules of the land that allow us to be able to um, progress um, as 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 a unit. And not as individuals. So I think I, I absolutely agree culturally. Um, it, it makes a lot of sense why the adaptation is different from the West. Um, but you know, I think with 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 your technology right now, uh, it poses so many more questions in the future of how. And, and you're correct. You know, Singapore can be the test market for this um, because because of the unique conditions you find yourselves in. But um, I also know that you have this partnership, um, I, I believe, with, with Jeremy, uh, a company that um, maybe you could describe and, and, and discuss with us. I think this is very interesting in terms of how you're going to move forward with, with the robotics um, that clean, oh, with robotics um, uh, in particular. OK. Um, after COVID-19, there are a lot of inquiry from the client. Uh, they want to do not only uh, for the cleaning, but also for the disinfection for the COVID-19. And so we found that the Jami, uh, which is the Australian company, and who has the uh, cutting edge uh, UVC disinfection function, uh, so that we can, uh, we jointly developed the add-on solution on top of the WIS, so that the uh, WIS can turn into the uh, cleaning and disinfection, UVC dis disinfection robot, uh, two in one. So uh, we can provide uh, the uh, UBC disinfection on the top of the, the cleaning function uh, using the Jami. And we are selling the, this Jami add on for all over, all over the world. So, Kent, I do believe that um, SoftBank Robotics is expanding across APAC. Uh, could you give us more information on that? Okay. Um, currently, we do the business in the uh, several countries, including the Japan, Hong Kong, Singapore. But we like to expand that this business to uh, all over the uh, uh, Asian uh, country, um, one by one. So we can duplicate the uh, best practice uh, case study from Singapore, from Japan to other country, and we are working on the several country. For example, uh, we are doing the uh, launch uh in thailand uh let's say next month so or let's say taiwan maybe uh two months later so that kind of the things uh you know we are doing right now so expansion to all over the asia is our plan when you expand to a particular country what does that entail in terms of the business expanding is it um, establishing a local presence or is it more of let's say a distribution partner for you to be able to bring um, your product services to uh, a greater geographical scale. Um, uh, what is it exactly you do when you expand to a different country? Uh, let's say both way. Uh, we have the uh, local entity in Singapore or Australia, Hong Kong, but the some area like uh, Thailand or Taiwan, uh, we don't have any, any local entity, so we should find the local partner. But point is the we are not. Uh, providing the box selling type of the solution. Uh, I mean, we are doing the, let's say, digital transformation service. So we need the enterprise level of support as well as the customer success consultancy. So we should have the strong local presence to support each vertical. So that's the reason why we, we should find that the local partner anyway. Right. Okay, Kent. 
I would like to, um, before I get to, because I have standard questions that I, that I ask all my guests, but before I go there, um, I'd like to get an appreciation of, um, I guess, the failures that you've had uh, over at SoftBank. Um, what is the way by which you are able to adapt to these failures, given the kind of culture that you have in SoftBank? Um, how much is it, I guess, allowed? Because we all know that failures are an integral part of success. So perhaps we could get deeper into how failures are treated um, mm. and also used as a learning mechanism for you at SoftBank, not just for you, but for your portfolio companies that you're a part of as well? Hmm. Um, basically, we are doing the new business and the 70% uh, of the new business uh, become failure. So in SoftBank group, uh, failure is fine, uh, but the, we need to minimize the failure, right? And increase the success rate. So that's our mission. But most important things is the we shouldn't die uh, when we fail. So that's that's, <laughs> that's a point. Good. I mean, we can fail, but the, we shouldn't go bankrupt or we shouldn't die. So let's say we, we can manage that the you know worst case scenario uh, because that the, we should expect that the failure at the timing of the you know start. But so that, that's the only one condition uh, for the start of the new project. Right. So there's this, there's this way by, by which uh, companies sort of try to see um, or manage the failure of a particular project or company or initiative. It's, it's, um, uh, the term is red teaming. So you come up with a team that essentially is in charge of trying to find holes or weaknesses in a particular idea, product, business. Is this something that you do? Um, um, and is this something that um, is encouraged as well in terms of how you're able to manage, um, I guess, the downside of coming up with a new project or an initiative? Yes, correct. So we call it soft branding. So, you know, when we fail, we need to fail. But the, the most important thing is the we can do the soft branding, da, 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 the hard branding. So, for example, Paper. We cannot say it's a failure, uh, but the you know at the beginning, Masa, you know said okay. that the, so we before know, before we before we uh, discuss that, so um, would you care to give light or shed some light into Pepper? Uh, what okay. exactly is Pepper? Okay, so Pepper is the uh, Pepper was the Masa's vision for the robot. Uh, let's say uh, seven years ago, and the initially he want to sell. He wanted to sell the robot paper uh, to the household uh, consumer, but the, it's very how to say te technological challenge is very high uh, to meet the customer's expectation for the household. So we need to pivot the target market to the professional B two B, and the, finally, you know there are several restaurants uh, they are using the paper for the customer interaction or concierge or welcoming. So let's say those kind of the things uh, we are doing, then let's say we can do some kind of the soft running. So, you know, what I want to say is maybe- right. so, uh, sorry, sorry, before yeah. we go there. So for those who are not familiar with Pepper, so mm -hmm. Pepper is a, is a humanoid robot, correct? And, wh and what right. does Pepper do? What, do, what does Pepper or how does Pepper interact? Okay, so Pepper is the yes, a humanoid robot, and the uh, he can, you know, uh, understand the, what uh, the people are saying, and the, he can speak, and the, uh, there is a tablet on the chest so that the, he can uh, describe the information uh, through the voice as well as the tablet. Also, uh, initial thoughts uh, we can use it for the companion in the uh, consumer uh, household, but the Let's say there are a lot of the, you know, topic uh, in the house. So we cannot expect that the, you know, what kind of the discussion, you know, people, you know, start saying. So that's the reason why uh, we change uh, to the B2B market because, of the, okay, for, for example, sushi restaurant, you know, all of the discussion is about sushi. 
So <laughs> we can expect right, that. Right. So, so people, such, hmm. Yeah. So if you went that direction, it would have um, put so many uh, expectations for uh, Pepper to solve everyone's problems, right? If you were looking for a companion um, beyond Google, because Google, you can ask the questions, but the robot might not specifically be able to solve or grant your request, right? It maybe can give you an answer to certain questions, but to be able to translate that to a companion that actually um, responds in a way that will be able to satisfy your request, um, I guess is, as you said, it, it just casts, um, I guess, maybe too wide a net. Um, unlike in, in the particular application that you've described, it's, it's, it's totally different because you, you can actually, I guess, program um, to be able to, uh, it to be able to uh, implement or solve very specific challenges. Can you, can you get into that? Yeah, correct. So yes, uh, we understand that the, uh, there is a technical limitation for meeting the customer needs for B2C household. So that's the reason why we are uh, you know, changing. Uh, we changed the you know, target market to the B2B. The, some use case like a restaurant or retail or hotel so that we can limit the topic, uh, you know, variety of the topic and use case. Uh, so let's say you know thousands of the paper is still uh, used in the uh, all those uh, restaurant or the hotel. But the let's say important things is the how flexible uh, we can change the business model, understand the limitation of the how to say market and technology. Right, and and the direction obviously you can you can easily pivot, um, but in terms of something like pepper. I'm sure you've invested so much resources and time into the first objective uh, that Pepper was. So do you find Pepper from its original, um, I guess, uh, purpose, would you consider that a, a failure or would you consider it as a stepping stone to developing, um, I guess, your thesis for what uh, a humanoid robot can do uh, for people? Okay. This is de definitely that the, not the failure and but the stepping stone. Um, we learn the very important things uh, from the paper. Um, in the robot industry, we shouldn't start from the technology or hardware or product. We should start from the customer needs. And then we can find that the who has the best technology. If we start from the you know technology or hardware, and then uh, maybe we can use this technology for this market, maybe not uh, change next market, maybe not. Then market size is the smaller, smaller, smaller. So, yes, with, with Pepper, was that the original, uh, I guess, oh, way? You yes. started with the hardware? Okay. Yeah. Pepper, okay. we started from the hardware uh, or vision. And then uh, initial market is B2C and people, B2B. So it was, we, it was Masa's original vision, yes, correct? Yes, okay. yes. And we learn uh, it's not a good story for the hardware. I mean, it, it, it might be okay for the software, but for the hardware, there is a huge investment for the manufacturing line, product design. So we should start from the market need, and then we can find the technology. That's the reason why we started the Sopan Vision Fund and Sopan Robotics and the collaboration. So, I mean, everything is kind of the stepping stone. Um, we have the words uh, uh, in Japan, uh, Japanese words, um, um, let's say mid straw, straw millionaire. Uh, it's a story like a, a very poor people who just have a one straw, but you know, that people exchange this straw to orange. And then uh, they exchange the orange to horse. And then they can extend the host to the house. So it's like, a, you know, all of the, you know, step is the stepping stone for the millionaire. And there is some meaning uh, or some learnings for those each steps. So maybe paper is very important step for us, but the, because there is a paper, we are currently doing the green robot, trade delivery robot or other robot. 
Methods to Greatness in partnership with Perfect Health Philippines will be giving away premium healthcare products to our loyal listeners and subscribers. There will be weekly winners of Perfect Relaxer Massage Guns worth 9,900 pesos. And at the end of 12 weeks, we will give one lucky subscriber a chance to take home a fully loaded Perfect Health Trinity Massage Chair worth 200,000 pesos. All you have to do is subscribe to the Methods to Greatness podcast and follow us on our social media accounts on Facebook and LinkedIn and share the post link in the show notes of this episode on your feed. And if you know someone who you feel would benefit from our conversations and content on the show, tag them for more chances to win our prizes. We always want you, our listeners, to aspire to improve yourselves in every aspect of your lives so you can be the best you can possibly be. Check out the Methods to Greatness social media channels for more details. So I would like to now get to my, my questions that I ask all my guests here on Methods to Greatness. So Kent, I'd like to find out what makes you Asian, in particular, what makes you Japanese? Maybe, uh, you know, actually, I'm a Japanese, but the, I live in Singapore right now. My family got the uh, uh, education. My children got the, got the education in Singapore. And I realized that the what is the difference between Japan and other country is the Japanese education focus more on the how to guess or how to estimate that the other people feel. So let's say you said that the consensus type of the community is the kind of the base of the idea of the Japanese culture because it is a very small island we need to work with others. So understanding of how others feel is very important for Japanese people. While maybe global uh, context, uh, we need to express the opinion you know, by each people and how to present uh, my idea, my opinion. So that is a more like a global uh capability and the japanese people is not good at doing this so maybe you know we are very good at the understanding the how other feel but we are not so good at the in explaining the, the what we think right but but for you in particular um is there anything about you your personal your your you as a person that um you feel makes you japanese uh, so are, are you telling me that you share that same observation in terms of you personally. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you you not being, I guess, readily able to express yourself, but understanding um, how people think and adjusting, I guess, based on on that. Is that um, by 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 telling me all? The, is it is it what makes you Japanese? You feel? Yes, yes. I think that this is the let's say uh, we should we should leverage that. Uh, advantage uh, because that they, maybe we are good at doing this so sometimes we need to do that kind of the understanding of the other people sometimes it's gonna be the hurdle for doing something right. but the yes we should leverage that that characteristic so this we, we believe that the, that might be the you know japanese specific right say a characteristic is there anything from your country from from japan i know that you're living in Singapore now, but is there anything from Japan that uh, you would like to recommend for people to see, try, taste, um, feel that is uniquely Japanese, that maybe people who come to Japan um, should be able to do or should be able to try? Yeah. Um, please come to Japan because at the, uh, I realized that the, you know, Japanese how to say uh, natural environment or historical environment is really good to see, as well as the food is the amazing and it's yes. very cheap. It's very cheap, um, <laughs> especially right now. The Japanese yen went down with mid year twenty twenty two. So at this point, you're saying that yen is down. So this is the perfect time to go visit. Yes, it's the perfect timing to come. <laughs> well, I've been to Japan once, uh, and and I can say that uh, well, relative to the Philippines, uh, which is a third world country, prices were high. But now you're saying that, um, yeah, this is the perfect time. Uh, uh, is there anything in particular that you would like for people to try? 
well yeah please try all of the you know food i mean i mean the or let's say not only for the sushi type of the japanese typical food but also the all of the how to say i'm um, fast food i mean you know japanese beef rice bowl or, you know it's just a two or three dollars i mean i don't think that we can eat those kind of the food in two or three dollars in the advanced country in the world so Let's say please try <laughs> all over the food and the yeah. C could you say 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 that again? Uh, in terms of the fast food, what is the name? Uh, it's a beef ball. Uh, it's a gyudon beef ball. Beef ball, beef ball, or gyudon. Gyudon. Uh, beef on the rice. Yes, so that's beef on rice. <laughs> so that is something that people should um, try. I'm sure in in various parts of the world. There has been local adaptations of that, but what you're saying is, if you do go to the to, to Japan, then that is the the local authentic gyudon should be something that should try. So, so okay. So Kent, I'd like to find out who um, is your modern day hero or superhero, and and if you have one, uh, what powers would this superhero have? Okay. Um... My favorite works uh, is the the best way to predict the future is to invent it, which is the word of the Alan Kay, uh, which is the father of the computer. So all of the innovation in the IT industry uh, can be described uh, based on these words, right? I mean, uh, Apple computer uh, invented by Steve Jobs or let's say Tesla Motors by Elon Musk, everything, I mean, their concept is the, they invented. Uh, that's the reason why they don't have to uh, expect or predict the future. So that might be the, so yes, uh, not only that the Alan Kay, but the, you know, IT uh, innovator uh, follow this rule uh, because that the, you know, they don't, Follow that the traditional way of the thinking, they can just invent the future. So that's the, my, how to say, uh, favorite words. Okay. Kent, if you were a, if you were ever given a chance to give a commencement speech, what would be your message to um, our young students or our graduating students who are now um, being thrust into a world wherein we have had for a good number of years had to deal with COVID. Uh, and in the future, for those who are looking at developing, possibly inventing um, the future, what would be your message to them? Okay. Um, following the you know, same you know, words, I mean, from the RNK, uh, we can say that the, the same, um, but the best way to predict the future is to invent it. So please uh, do what you want and that is the future. So maybe, especially for the IT industry, uh, you know, we can design uh, what we like to, you know, uh, leave or what we like to develop. So, I mean, there is no limitation, restriction uh, for the future and the, you know, we can try. So that's maybe, you know, I can say. Yeah. Kent, what keeps you up at night or is there anything that wakes you up in the morning? For me, uh, the business is more like a private. So all of the you know business project uh, you know I I'm doing right now is the very exciting and the motivated and the, I I just want to do. That's the reason why I do. So you know I I don't have enough time to sleep because that I want to do uh, this. Maybe you know everyone said it's a it's a work it's a job, but for me. You know, it's the kind of the my private or my personal things I want to do. Right, and, and Japanese really are known to be um, really highly invested in their job, in their in their mission, um, and you're known to really take work seriously to the point that, as you said, it's your your passion, your job is what you also like to do in in your spare time. So, um, is that something that you feel is your superpower? In a way, and um, if so, if that is, if you are constantly thinking of work, how do you now 
try to balance it. The most important thing is the uh, try, we try to find that the what is the how to say mutually beneficial uh, both for business and company and for private or you know ourselves. I mean some area uh, you know we can be the very you know excited or motivated at the same time companies think that the uh, this is very valuable uh, for you to do so if we can find that area and we can focus on those areas to do that's very good for personal life as well as the company performance i don't think that the all of the cases all of the people can find that area but the maybe everyone try to find uh, that area or let's say try to move to those area uh, so that the all of the task or job is very interesting and the let's say performance will be better right mm. and what is the one thing that you wish you could have known or learned sooner maybe we are in the process of the uh still uh developing the market and the uh actually we are focusing more on the how to say customer adaptation or usage uh that kind of a thing i mean let's say we didn't cross the chasm yet uh maybe sooner or later we we're gonna cross the chasm then we we're gonna have the normal uh enterprise business condition like a price competition or let's say competitor or you know marketing that type of a thing actually uh robot business uh is not in that area yet uh but the maybe uh, near the future uh we should learn that kind of the business activity uh partnering partnering with the uh existing partner for this normal business activity area right okay so can outside of work is there anything that you do to um i guess in your downtime uh, for you to once again regain focus because you are focused so much on uh the business um and uh, is there anything that you do in your downtime that allows you to perhaps decompress and regain your focus Okay, um, I do uh, jogging uh, as well as the climbing the mountain. So maybe that's gonna <laughs> make me more relaxed or let's say uh, forget about all of the <laughs> work. Right, right. How, how often do you do that? Well, basically, you know, once a quarter, but the at this moment, uh, family is in Singapore and the, I, sometimes i have to be in tokyo so let's say those two or three years uh i don't have the enough time uh to do this. yes yes <laughs> but right. maybe from now <laughs> we can do more okay okay so um can you know we will all pass from this world we will all move on uh to another place eventually um everyone will pass and i'd like to know um when that happens for you what would your epitaph say? Uh, I know it's a actually, tough one, but yeah, <laughs> actually, I didn't, I, I didn't uh, think of the, you know, uh, the time when I, I'm gonna die. So, <laughs> but maybe, you know, I don't want to some, I don't want to do there's some regret uh, for anything uh, not to do uh, so that the I want to try uh, everything and then maybe 70 percent is failure but the you know we I don't feel any regret so let's say no regret uh, because the, you know he tries everything so that kind of <laughs> word uh, should be in the tombstone are you are you talking about um on on a professional basis on a personal basis yeah yeah both of... both okay mm, mm. Uh, so down to my last question and i ask all of my guests here on methods to greatness mm. there's one thing that you do that you would like perhaps for me to try or for anyone to try for that matter 
that uh, you do successfully or you would recommend that people uh, you know, give a shot in, in trying to do this, what would that be? Mm, okay. Um, I'm a kind of the bookworm. So I read a lot. Um, and the, actually, I was the uh, leader of the, let's say, library association in the junior high school or high school. Oh. So that level, I really love books. So I fully recommend that the reading any books because that the, you know, it, it's like a, just a stealing or a copying that is someone that maybe, you know, 100 hours or 200 hours deep thought. So let's say, but we can just, you know, copy that idea in one hour, two hours. So it's very efficient so that the any any kind, but the I fully recommend that the let's keep reading some books, uh, even in the elder ages. So that's going to be that's going to help uh, our life. Right. Is there any particular book that you would like to recommend? Well, <laughs> um i love the how to say uh kind of the science type type of the book but the not only that the business uh you know type of the book but also that the uh for example neuroscience or science of the emotion or or okay. let's say history of the you know people or us that kind of the you know fact is kind of the uh, you know bring some idea for the business so right. let's say i i recommend that you not only just reading the business related book but also that the other related other science area uh is very helpful for right. the business you know idea right. generation thank you so much kent for sharing all of your insights i think um this conversation with you has really opened up my mind to um, I guess the way Japanese see, or, or at least how you see um, as part of the SoftBank organization, how to grow and how to also treat failure as an integral part of success. And I think, um, you know, you would not have grown to such, a, such an extent, such a scale, if you did not have that vision from your leader and also people like you who support him fully and who are able to execute um, such, I would say, unpredictable, um, uh, you know, movements, but only it, it can only be made possible with the help of a very, um, I guess, professional and, and, and highly capable team that is able to support that vision. So uh, I thank you, Kent, for guesting here on Methods to Greatness. And um, please, for those who would like to uh, follow you or SoftBank or any of the initiatives that you have, where can they get more information or where can they follow you? You can find that the a uh, lot of the, uh, let's say, robot uh, in your country so that the, let's try to find that the, uh, the case study of the robotization. I mean, let's experience. Uh, so that's maybe the first step. And the, you can contact me uh, by the LinkedIn or, you know, any method and the, I'm I'm very happy to work with you guys uh, for any you know project and the, we can provide that the a uh, lot of the AI or robot technology and then uh, maybe we can jointly uh, propose the how to say vertical solution. Okay, Kenichi Kent Yoshida, thank you very much for guesting here on Methods to Greatness. Thank you. Methods to Greatness is powered by Converge experience better. If you'd like to work with Converge, check them out at gofiber.ph or connect with them through their social media channels. Methods to Greatness is also brought to you by Perfect Health Philippines, a leading provider of innovative first-class massage and healthcare products across Southeast Asia. If you would like me to interview anyone on the face of the earth and want them on the podcast, or if you want to collaborate with us for future content or sponsorship opportunities, or if you just have any recommendations on how we can get better, just send us an email at john at methodstogreatness.com. That's john at methodstogreatness.com. Until then, we'll see you next time.